So it's a great pleasure to have Jerome Quintin with us. He's a postdoc at Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, Potsdam. And he's going to speak about bouncing cosmology, the current state, and the road ahead. Please, Jerome. Okay, thank you, Sayantan. And uh, let me start uh, by first thanking you, Sayantan, for giving me the opportunity to give this online talk today. And I want to start by saying that uh, as you encouraged me, my plan is really to give a sort of review talk uh, aimed for master's students and, and PhD students. So it's really going to be a sort of overview of what is bouncing cosmology, talking about the main ideas and current results and, and the future of this field. Uh, I won't go into any particular detail of specific uh, models, but if at any point you would like me to elaborate a little more on a particular topic, feel free to interrupt and, and ask your questions. So let me start with um, what's basically the standard picture of a very early universe cosmology. In order to, to explain our current universe with its large-scale structures and uh, the CMB and the fluctuations in the CMB, we typically need a theory of the very early universe that fits into this picture right here. So this is a sketch of co-moving scales versus time. And the key scale is this co-moving Hubble radius uh, here, the, the red curve. And it has to be uh, uh, a scale that is first shrinking as a function of time. And what this enables is to have uh, initially some uh, fluctuations with uh, wavelength of the order of one over k, where k is the wave number of the fluctuation, to be to start uh, initially inside this horizon. And so these initial conditions are going to originate from there, evolve, and at some point exit uh, the horizon, freeze, and then evolve on super Hubble scales, and at later times uh, re-enter the horizon, and that way um, correspond to, to what we observe, uh, namely the CMB scale structures. The point where the co-moving Hubble radius is going from contraction to expansion is usually where we said that reheating occurs, uh, which is when particles that we observe today are created and we have the beginning of the radiation dominated uh, phase of expansion of standard Big Bang cosmology. So we essentially have um, a few requirements uh, to, be able, to be able to explain the formation of structures in the universe. We need some suitable initial conditions. Um, could be a quantum vacuum, possibly a thermal state or something else. And then uh, a phase during which the co-moving Hubble radius is shrinking and that lasts for a sufficiently long period of time. And there's a, there's a number of, of models that you can construct that will satisfy these requirements. Um, for instance, you could have a phase of accelerated expansion where the scale factor is growing almost exponentially as a function of time. And in doing so, the Hubble parameter is approximately a constant. And so here, if I draw now um, here with, with physical uh, scales on the horizontal axis and time on the vertical axis, uh, the physical Hubble radius is approximately constant. And this allows uh, fluctuations with very small wavelengths initially to be stretched exponentially during this phase of inflation, exit the Hubble radius, and uh, once inflation ends, the wavelength is, is uh, growing at a smaller rate than the Hubble radius, so it re-enters the horizon at a later time. And this could that way uh, explain uh, the formation of structures. So but that's not the only possibility. Uh, yes. Why you have uh, written mod of age? Uh, because as we'll see shortly, uh, the Hubble parameter could be negative. negative. Um, yeah. So th this will come in a couple of slides. So another possibility is to have something like a Genesis scenario, uh, where instead initially the scale factor could almost be a constant. It could be quasi-static. And at this point, the Hubble parameter is approximately vanishing. And the Hubble radius, the inverse of this, will be almost infinite. And so initially, any fluctuations will be uh, 
inside the horizon. But at some point, if the universe suddenly expands and, and you have standard Big Bang cosmology uh, starting after that, then this Hubble radius will shrink very rapidly. Uh, fluctuations uh, will exit the Hubble radius um, and then evolve on super Hubble scales and re-enter later on during standard Big Bang. And another possibility now is one where we have contraction, and that's where, why the absolute value is important. So in this case, we could have standard um, uh, FRW evolution, but for a contracting universe. Uh, so here, W will be the equation of state, and it could be normal matter satisfying the strong energy condition. But uh, this would be a phase where the time is negative, and, and correspondingly, a Hubble parameter would be negative. But still, if you take one over the absolute value of A times H, then this quantity is shrinking. And to see this, well, so this contracting phase then corresponds to this contracting Hubble radius uh, in blue. And again, uh, fluctuations start below the Hubble radius, exit at some point during the contraction, and finally re-enter at some point during, during the expansion after a bounce. So this in, in implies that there needs to be a, a transition from a contracting phase to uh, standard Big Bang cosmology where we have expansion. And this occurs through a bounce and where presumably new physics uh, enters and allows it to be non-singular. And I'll talk more about this very, uh, very soon. Now, uh, all of these uh, models could, could very well happen at this point with just the requirements I, I mentioned. But now let's ask the question, what, what is it that we actually observe? And uh, that could it maybe tell us uh, what, what happened in reality. So uh, our, our main observable is the CMB, these uh, fluctuations in temperature of the very uh, first photons we, we, that, that could uh, move freely after the Big Bang. And what we do is that we map the whole sky and observe these uh, variations in temperature and we decompose this in spherical harmonics. And the amplitude of, of these fluctuations, we then, we then do statistics with them. And in particular, we could compute the two-point correlation function, and that's the quantity on the right. And this becomes uh, an angular power spectrum uh, that has a lot of, of structure in it. Uh, there are oscillations um, that, that tell us about yeah, the statistics of these temperature fluctuations. Uh, of the CMB. So there's a lot of physics entering in there. Uh, uh, but Jeff, then we can, yes, you have a question. One thing, uh, once you have written the two point correlation function in the previous slide, yep. yeah, we all know that this, this thing appears, but can you please tell why this, uh, uh, there are two things, why this L into L plus one by two L plus one, this factor appears. Secondly, what this T bar mean? This okay. T bar. T -bar. Yeah. Okay. This is basically the average temperature of the CMB, uh, which is around 2.7 Kelvin, and we're dividing by it because we we want a, a ratio of temperatures here. Um, so this is uh, fluctuations with respect to the average. So and in particular, the color codes that I didn't explain. Uh, so if you are in yellow here, this is zero, meaning the the temperature is the average temperature. Anything in red will be hotter than the average. Anything in blue will be colder than the average. And this the scale is here is micro kelvins. So uh, so very dark red will be 300 micro kelvins above the average of, as I said, 2.7 kelvins. And now uh, on the right here, uh, the L L plus one. Uh, this this factor here is is really convention. Um, and you'll see different plots. Um, you, could, you could plot a two-point function alone without this free factor. Um, one usually also plots the CL, which is the same quantity, but without the, the numerator there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's, it will yeah, simply well change the is scale. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a question of, of uh, what's nicest to plot and, and be able to see uh, the, the, uh, as best as possible what are the, the, the shape of the power spectrum here. Hmm. 
Now, as I said, this is, a, is measured at the time of the CMB, about 300,000 years after um, this radiation phase started, uh, the standard Big Bang. But we can, uh, we fairly understand well the physics that happened between the, the beginning of this standard Big Bang phase up to the time of the CMB. And we, we could re undo this physics and, and look, well, what were the initial conditions at that point? Uh, what uh, was the origin of these uh, fluctuations and that led later to these temperature fluctuations? And what we find is uh, now on the right, um, the, the power spectrum, PR, uh, which is the power in curvature perturbations. And curvature perturbations, we can think of them as being a combination of uh, perturbations in the metric, so of, of space time, and of matter, um, matter density. And now the, the plot here on the right, this is, uh, it shows some confidence uh, intervals on, um, based on what the, the CMB um, uh, tells us. And where it's really well measured, um, what we see is that this is almost a flat line, uh, or at least it has just a small slope in it. So usually it's convenient to parameterize this power spectrum with some amplitude AS, and then as a power law. So K, the wave number, to some power, uh, usually parameterized as NS minus one. And if this were really a flat line, then this power would be zero, meaning that NS would be uh, one. But here what we observe is that this is just slightly smaller than one. So we say that it has a slight red tilt to it. And this is very, very well measured. It's very well constrained. And that's something that any theory of the very early universe, early universe should reproduce, namely the, the evolution of these uh, curvature perturbations should uh, lead you to such a power spectrum uh, at the end of this phase, so at the beginning of radiation domination. So Jerome, yep. uh, what this pivot scale corresponds to? So the, the pivot scale is, uh, is just convenient for the parameterization. So it's an arbitrary scale that you can set um, in, in order to, to compute these numbers AS and NS. In particular, uh, one usually sets it around either point 0 0.002 megaparsec inverse or 0 0.05 megaparsec inverse. And this is just the, the yeah, as, as the name says, the pivot, scale, the pivot point scale where uh, uh, one sets the power law. And um, the, usually the, the numbers such as the amplitude and uh, the, the spectral index will slightly vary if you change the pivot scale. Um, yeah. Um, so you said uh, that your amplitude and uh, the spectral tilt also function of pivot scale as well. Well, yeah, the, the reason is that the, the full power spectrum is, is a function of K and it yeah. might not be exactly a power law if it, if it yeah. And uh, even if we're exactly a par an exact power law, um, the, the amplitude of it, we have to specify it at some scale. And um, you usually choose some scale, um, we call it the pivot scale, determine the amplitude at that point, and then the rest of the power is given by the, the, the power law from there. Okay. Um, so that's the idea. Now, it might not be exactly uh, a power law, and, that, and now I come to what is it that we do not observe at this point, or that we don't measure very well yet. And this includes running, running of the spectral index, uh, usually parameterized by this alpha s, which is basically the derivative of an s with respect to lo the logarithm of the wave number k. At this point, this is a number that is pretty much consistent with zero. Uh, so at this point, we cannot say that we observe any running, any change in uh, the spectral index that you change the, the scale at which you measure it. Now, this is uh, all information about the two-point correlation function, but you could also look at higher point statistics, including the three-point correlation function. And uh, this would then be related to uh, the primordial three-point correlation function of your curvature perturbations, uh, which we call primordial non-Gaussianities. And those are usually uh, parameterized by some amplitude parameters, 
called FNL. And we usually talk also about different shapes, uh, the local shape, the equilateral shape, orthogonal shape, which are essentially different uh, shapes of, or different combinations of the wave numbers K1 to K3. Uh, in particular, if you make a triangle with these, with these wave numbers, you look at different uh, limits of these wave numbers, telling you different, uh, uh, different limits of the, the true point correlation function. And at this point, um, these numbers are, again, all pretty much consistent with being zero, given the large uncertainties at this point. So we can't say that we, we really measured any primordial non-gashinity at this point. Similarly, uh, we, can then, we could then look at uh, primordial tensor perturbations, which are primordial gravitational waves, uh, which, again, we parameterize by some power spectrum that is given with given by some amplitude and some spectral index, AT and MT. And at this point, all we can say really from observation is that the, the tensor to scalar ratio, this number R, defined as the, the ratio of the power spectrum of tensor perturbations over the power spectrum of curvature perturbations is bounded uh, from above by some number that is about 0.07 um, at 95% confidence level. So we haven't measured any primordial gravitational waves, but we know that there can't be too much at this point because otherwise we would have measured them. So that's what we do not see at this point, but nevertheless tells us a lot, a lot about the very early universe. And once again, uh, to build successful um, theory uh, of primordial cosmology, one should be able to, to uh, predict these numbers. So now let's move on to what do the theories actually predict at this point. So I started uh, by mentioning inflation and well, there's a wealth of inflation models and uh, a lot could indeed match these numbers. Um, that, that what makes uh, the success of inflation, it can give you uh, uh, the, the spectral index and small non gaussianities and small tensor scalar ratio and so on. Um, but that won't be the focus of today's talk. Instead, I, I want to mention um, the alternatives. And uh, for example, one could uh, discuss um, Genesis scenario. An example of this is string gas cosmology, a model coming from string theory, um, proposing that the universe was almost static initially uh, and dominated by a gas of strings. And uh, so current calculations show that you could actually predict a, a lot of these numbers, uh, give the right spectral index, tensor scalar ratio, um, and so on. But there's still some challenges there. In particular, there's more work to be done on, on the theoretical foundation. Um, maybe not too surprising because string theory is so hard and we don't understand it so well yet. Uh, this won't be uh, the focus of today's talk. Instead, I will talk more about the, the last class of models I mentioned, which is bouncing cosmology, and I'll spend the rest of this talk uh, telling you about it. So I, I separated this talk in, in two parts. So I first want to review um, what models of, of contraction could uh, explain um, the, the, the data from the CMB. And I'll focus on two. First, matter balance cosmology, and then exporotic cosmology. And I'll tell you, okay, what's the idea uh, for, for these theories? What do they predict? Uh, um, what, what do they do well? What, what doesn't work there? Um, and then what's, what's the road ahead for, for these theories? And then I'll move on and talk about uh, non-single cosmology, which is, which is the bounce, which is this transition from contraction to expansion that is necessary in, in these models. And uh, more generally talk about how a cosmological uh, singularity can be avoided. And again, I'll talk about a few models. Um, this won't be comprehensive in any way, but I'll just mention a few ideas. Once again, talk about uh, what, what, they, what they predict, how well they're doing, what, what doesn't work, and uh, what are the remaining questions and, and road ahead uh, in that field. Okay, so let me start um, first about contraction and talk about uh, the different models. So our goal, the, the main thing we observe, as I said, is a power spectrum of curvature perturbations, which is nearly scale invariant, meaning that PR uh, at the function of K is almost independent of K, 
So it goes as k to some power that is almost zero. Let's see how we could obtain that. So what we do to compute this is that we look at linear perturbations. Uh, so we, we look at cosmological perturbations for, uh, say, general relativity plus some matter. And it's usually governed by an equation, uh, which is called the sasaki mukhanov equation, which has this form. And here, a prime is a, time, a conformal time derivative. V is the sasaki mukhanov variable, and it's related to the curvature perturbation R. The subscript k means that this is the Fourier transform, with k being the wave number of the perturbations. And the variable z uh, relates it to. And is, this is basically a function of the scale factor A, as well as epsilon, which is like the slow wall parameter nucleation, or more generally, it's related to the equation of state, um, the function of pressure and energy density. Now, in this equation, if z double prime over z is equal to 2 over tau squared, let's just make this assumption at this point, and assume that we have a quantum vacuum initially, uh, meaning that we have a bunch Davies state as we look at very early on and for fluctuations with very large wave numbers, so the limit where minus k tau goes to infinity, then we find that at late times when minus k tau goes to zero, that the variable v scales as 1 over k to the 3 halves times tau. And if you compute the resulting power spectrum, um, it goes as k cubed times the squared of, of this quantity. And the resulting expression is essentially independent of k. So this is scale invariant as wanted. So this, this could explain uh, the power spectrum we observe. Now, this all assumed that we had the sub double prime over z equal to 2 over tau squared. How could this be? Well, if you have a constant equation state, uh, meaning if p over rho is a constant as a function of time, then you basically have z proportional to the scale factor, and you need uh, z double prime over z, which is just equal to a double prime over a, to be 2 over tau squared. If, if a of tau is just a power law, then you can compute a double prime over a, and it is this expression. And if you ask it to be equal to 2 over tau squared, it's only two possibilities. Either the power is one minus one or is two. And so these two possibilities are basically exponential expansion or matter dominated contraction. The first, um, basically the sitter, we already saw it, that, that's the whole idea behind inflation. While the second is basically matter dominated uh, contraction, as I said. So that would be the idea behind having a matter bounce cosmology. So the, the idea is, is quite simple and uh, quite neat. And so we have, we have a model, uh, a theory, matter bounce cosmology, and it's, it's easily modeled in the sense that all you need is a phase of matter dominated contraction. And you could do this by having a scalar field, a massive scalar field that is coherently oscillating, or you could have a, a fluid, uh, could be composed of dust, you know, non relativistic particles, or even cold dark matter, um, and it would behave that way. And out of this, you, you do get a scale invariant uh, power spectrum of, of curvature perturbations. And uh, um, if you do the calculation, you also find that the amplitude of these, of these perturbations is given by the scale of the bounce, meaning the, the scale of at the end of the, this contracting phase. And you also can compute the non gaussianities and you get an order of one number. So this is all uh, working well. Now, we don't exactly uh, measure scale invariant power spectrum. Uh, in fact, with very high precision, we know that it's red, it has a red tilt. So if you ask for a red tilt, then it means that you need a slight deviation from matter domination. And that's where it starts to become a little more complicated. Uh, in particular, if you want a small red tilt and not too much running, meaning that it remains a, red, a small red tilt, then you need some level of fine tuning. You need basically this effective pressure over energy density to be approximately constant over a long period of time. And you need this constant to be negative in order to get the red tilt. Um, negative, but again, very close to zero. So very close to being matter dominant. So at this point, it, it already gets a little less, less nice, uh, a little more complicated. Um, but now the real, the real trouble is that um, in addition to getting a scale invariant power spectrum of curvature perturbations, 
you also get scale variant power spectrum of tensor perturbations with pretty much the same amplitude. So specifically what this means is that your tensor to scalar ratio is of order 10, which is really, really ruled out. Um, if that were true, we would have observed primordial gravitational waves a long time ago. And, and lastly, also the, 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 another problem of such a theory is that it's unstable with respect to anisotropy. So now I'll, I'll briefly uh, expand on these two issues. So let's talk about tensor perturbations in the context of matter bounds cosmology. So tensor, per, tensor modes uh, basically follow a similar uh, sasaki mukhanov equation of motion. Here, u is related to h. Um, one, h would be one of the polarization states of the gravitational waves. But now the variable that uh, tells you about the evolution of, of, of this equation is the scale factor. Uh, but as we saw earlier, for curvature perturbations, when the equation of state was constant, it was also the scale factor that was telling us about the evolution of the equation of motion. So in the end, you get exactly the same equation of motion as the scalar modes. And if, if the origin of these fluctuations is the same, you have the same initial conditions, you're gonna end up with the same amplitude and the same spectrum. And in fact, if you compute the actual uh, number with the proper normalization of everything, you find that the tensor scalar ratio is given by 24. And well, just to be clear, this is not a factorial, this is just 24. But still, it's, it's an order of 10 number that, was, that would be really, really ruled out. How could this be possibly resolved? Um, well, there's a few possibilities and let's see if they work or not. Um, first, you could say, well, instead of assuming that the speed of sound in the theory is equal to the speed of light, let's say that it's a very small number. Uh, this could be modeled, for instance, with a case and scalar field. So not a standard kinetic term, but something slightly more general. And what you get is the following uh, equation of motion for your scalar perturbations. And the sound speed enters uh, with the wave number here. And correspondingly, the power spectrum is suppressed by a factor of one over CS, uh, amplified, sorry, by a factor of one over CS, and so the tensor to scalar ratio is suppressed by proportionally to the sound speed. And if you want then R to be smaller than 0.07, you basically need a sound speed that is smaller than about 0.003. So very, very small uh, speed of propagation for the fluctuations. But such a small number. Yeah, K sense means you want to mean that non-canonical kinetic terms or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, you, you, you would want a non-canonical kinetic term for this case of field. Uh, but I'll mention also at the end, it could also be uh, a fluid with uh, something like, like dust where naturally the, the sound speed is very small. Uh, but when, as I say uh, here, when the sound speed is very small, what happens is that uh, you can enter a regime of, of strong coupling where uh, higher uh, perturbations like the three point, um, well, three-point correlation function or, or just a, the third order of perturbation becomes larger or of the same order as the second order um, perturb one. So this becomes a worry and the perturbation theory breaks down. And in fact, if you compute um, uh, the exact number for the three-point uh, function and you look at uh, some shapes, for instance, the local shape of non-Gaussianities, you get this number here where you've got this factor of one over the S squared, and this becomes very, very large. And at the end, um, you cannot satisfy the bounds on R and FNL at the same time. So, so this basically doesn't work. And as I briefly mentioned, you could do the same with the fluid. Instead of assuming that you have a scalar field, you could just have a fluid composed of dust. And, and here, this, this uh, strong coupling or, or this, cr this uh, creation of non-linearity is manifest itself in a gravitational instability that can even lead to the formation of black holes. Uh, so for that model specifically, that, that will be uh, uh, a problem. Uh, but I'll, I'll come back uh, at the end of this section and talk about black holes some more. Um, they might play an interesting role uh, not related to the matter bounds scenario. Jerome, I have one uh, yes. study again. Uh, 
So uh, we have an upper bound of tensor to scalar ratio, yeah. but FNL is negligibly zero. Like yeah. there is no non-Gaussianity. But here, uh, like, uh, w can you please repeat the argument what you have said regarding FNL? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So basically, what I'm saying is that if you want to satisfy this bound on R, uh, this upper bound, you you want it to be at most 0.07. Yeah. And indeed, the sound speed to be at most. 0.003, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, and you compute the corresponding value of FNL, um, you get that FNL is at least um, 10 to the, what is it? This 10 to the minus one, minus three, High. basically 10 to the sixth. It's yeah. huge. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and we observe FNL to be at most here local, I just say my most order 10. So this is ruled out. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are there other possible resolutions? Well, yeah, sure. Um, you could say that instead of having curvature perturbations growing during the contracting phase, perhaps it could grow during the bounce. Um, that's usually, uh, it's hard to have them grow during the bounce, but if if that's the case, uh, but you could you could have um, the suppression of the tensor square ratio. What we found is that once again, by enhancing curvature perturbations, you're really creating large non gaussian entities. And once again, if uh, if you've satisfied a bound on R, you won't satisfy the one on FNL, and vice versa. So it's impossible to to meet the bounds at the same time. The possibilities that, that could work are if instead of always enhancing curvature perturbations, uh, you're in some way really suppressing the tensor perturbation. And one way of doing this is to add a, ma add a mass to the graviton. So look at massive gravity. In such a case, um, you immediately find that the power spectrum of tensor perturbations becomes blue tilted or even heavily blue such that on, on scales that we observe, um, the tensor scalar ratio would be very, very small, meaning the power spectrum tensor modes would be very, very suppressed. Uh, another possibility without assuming a massive uh, graviton um, would, would be to work with a yet more general uh, theory for the scalar field. So instead of just a P of X, we could work with uh, full horn Besky theory, which I'll talk more about uh, later on, but for now, what, what you need to know is that uh, it has many free functions. Uh, we call them G2, G3, G4, and G5. And um, there's a few papers that, that studied that and found that, well, there's a way of model building these functions such that uh, the evolution of, uh, of scalar modes and tensor modes are such that you satisfy the bound on R and you don't create too much non-cash entities. So it is possible at this level. Okay, now um, the, the, the last problem of, of matter bounds cosmology that I mentioned is related to isotropies. So to under understand this, let's look at uh, a Bianchi universe instead of a far W, where um, the, the variables theta i, these functions of, of time here, uh, basically tell you how the, the scale factor in different directions uh, evolves, and it could evolve differently in different directions. And at this point, the Einstein equations become the Freeman equations plus a contribution from these anisotropies. And the, uh, the anisotropies follow this equation. Uh, and the solution of this is simply uh, that the energy density of the anisotropy scales as uh, the anisotropies scale as a to the minus six. And those, this is very analogous to a massless scalar field in, in FRW. It's like a new contribution. And so if you look at the Freeman equation, uh, you get a new term, this rho anisotropy uh, over a to the six. And what you find is that this will always dominate at high energies. When the scale factor becomes very small, this term becomes very large. And in fact, it, it, it implies that you would need a lot of fine tuning of this rho theta initial, such that a, a phase of matter domination can be sustained for a long period of time. So what this means is that any anisotropic perturbation uh, will disrupt a phase of matter domination and it will quickly become anisotropy dominated. 
and and so that's pretty bad for for this for this model. Okay. Let me now move on to um, exoprotic. So, uh, Jerome, model. please bet. Anybody, if you have any question up to this point, ask Jerome because he's moving to something else. Yep. Yeah, that was my last line on Maybe specifically matter back. Maybe we'll later. Yeah, sure. just move on. Yep. So now I'll talk about uh, a little bit about exoprotic cosmology. So the ideas, the, the idea of exoprotic cosmology uh, goes back to string theory uh, and even to, to, to brains, where the idea is that, well, there could be two three plus one dimensional end of the world brains that uh, would live in one higher dimension. Um, and then the, the distance between the two brains would act as a modulus and it will have a potential that is negative and of exponential form with this parameter C that is very large. And what this potential, this potential does is that it's like an attractive force between the brains and it leads to a very slow phase of contraction. So in, in, um, in the effective theory, you basically have a cosmology where the scale factor uh, is that of an FRW contracting universe with an equation state that is very, very large, very, very thick. Now, if you compute uh, your scalar and tensor perturbations from this, uh, what you find out of the box is that you get a, a, a number uh, that is large. You get a very blue tilt uh, or a blue spectrum. It's not even a tilt, blue spectrum for both uh, the scalar and tensor perturbations, um, particularly in the limit where this parameter C is very large. Uh, but then there were, uh, a few proposals um, to add a new field to the theory. And one possibility, and uh, maybe those are the latest proposals, is to add um, an entropic field called a chi that couples uh, kinetically to the acroprotic field chi with also an exponential of this form. And uh, this entropic field chi can acquire a scale invariant power spectrum. Um, quite easily, and this would then be converted into curvature perturbations that we observe today. In particular, uh, what you need is this parameter B to be at least uh, uh, very close or just a little larger than the parameter C, such that you get a, a slightly red tilted power spectrum. So this chi is the, chi is what field? Chi is, an, is a, a spectator field, it's an entropic field. And this, uh, is, uh, this is kind of a massless type of field. Yeah, it doesn't have a potential. Yeah. yeah, and at the background level, um, it, it was checked that a, a stable solution is essentially that this this chi is is just constant. Um, and for chi, one can treat this e to the power minus b phi as a dilaton type of coupling. Um, yeah, it looks like a dilaton type of coupling, uh, but note that it's not the whole action that has this, yeah, this, yeah, this factor. Yeah, so, action, yeah, yeah. True. Yeah. Okay, and so that's at the level of, of uh, the two-point function, uh, but you can also compute the non-Gaussianities that are produced from this. And depending on how the conversion process, uh, uh, the conversion from entropy, entropy perturbations to curvature perturbations is, is done, I usually get uh, non-Gaussianities that are order one, or at least, at, well, rather at most, order 10. So this, this is working fine. So um, just to quickly summarize uh, what, what's happening for exoprotic cosmology, well, it's quite easily modeled by scalar field um, and the motiva motivation is coming from string theory. You do get uh, scale invariant, uh, slightly red tilted curvature perturbation power spectrum, although you, you definitely need two fields for this to work. You then get about order one to order 10 non gaussianities And the power spectrum for, for primordial gravitational waves is, is very blue, meaning that your tensor to scalar ratio is effectively vanishing on, on the scales that we observe. Um, so this is all in agreement with current observations and a lot of these things uh, will continue to be tested in the future as, as our uh, measurements improve. 
Now, a last property of a chromatic cosmology is that it usually washes out anisotropies. So with that respect, it's doing a lot better than the matter bounds cosmology. And uh, let me just revisit that uh, if you have an chromatic field, what we immediately see is that it's now this uh, contribution that will dominate at higher energies. Indeed, um, as I said, the chromatic field has a very stiff equation state. Um, the parameter W is much greater than one. So its contribution to the Freeman equation here goes as A to some power that is much greater than six. So when A is very small, this term will always dominate. And in particular, any anisotropies that one had initially will be washed out. And there's no need to fine tune um, the anisotropies. And uh, also, yeah, uh, similarly, it implies that uh, this ekphrotic phase will be uh, stable to any creation of anisotropies. This was confirmed by uh, fully uh, non perturbative numerical studies of numerical relativity. Um, showing that any arbitrary initial anisotropies would be washed out uh, in, a chromatic, um, in an achromatic phase of contraction. Uh, but let me point out that um, that's true, uh, however, only if um, the field itself is isotropic. If um, instead one has something like a fluid of achromatic uh, matter, uh, that was itself anisotropic, meaning that it would have a pressure that is different in different directions. So one would have a parameter Wi for every direction uh, that is very stiff. Uh, they would all be very stiff, but different in different directions. And this could source anisotropies again. And to see this, um, schematically, the equation of motion for the anisotropies would then have a source term that depends on the difference between every individual pressure with respect to the average pressure. And so if the pressure changes from one direction to another, you get a, a source term there that can source the anisotropies. So the, the stability would be uh, compromised in that case. So what does meaning I not equal to J? Uh, I, I, all that I'm saying is that uh, for different directions. So if you look at oh, okay. the, the equation state in the X direction, it's different than in the J direction. No, there I have understood, but here you have written SI as a function of PJ. Oh, here, yes. Um, I'm saying that you have a source term um, that is a function of these pressures, uh, P1, P2, P3, but specifically the, it's a function of P1 minus the average, P2 minus the average, and P3 minus the average. Okay. So if the P1, 2, 3 were the same, then there would, there would be the average, and this would just vanish. So there would be no, no source term. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. OK, let me move on now to um, uh, discuss what could tell us uh, how, what, what could tell this apart from inflation, basically? Um, what could help us distinguish these possible alternatives from inflation when discussing uh, uh, observations. So you might have heard about this topic, uh, cosmological collider physics. I think it, it has drawn a lot of attention uh, in the field. And you might have seen uh, diagrams like this uh, of heavy field sigma being created and um, creating some signal in the three-point correlation function and so on. So the general idea there is that if you have heavy fields uh, lying around at the, uh, in the very early universe in inflation, then, then those are going to leave oscillations uh, and specific signals in the different correlation functions. So these heavy fields could be any new physics that appears uh, uh, at the scale that we haven't uh, measured uh, on Earth. So, um, for instance, you could have something like uh, the models of quasi-single field inflation, where you basically either classically excite uh, a massive field or simply have the natural quantum oscillations of, of, of this field. And the result of this is that you get some oscillating features in the, the, uh, the endpoint function, in the two, three, and so on um, correlation functions. 
So for instance, this, this sketch here is to show that uh, you could have the usual slow trajectory um, in, in, by the, the dashed line, but then on, you'd have a, a second field that uh, through this turning uh, gets excited and then starts oscillating and uh, creates uh, perturbations on top of the usual nearly scale invariant power spectrum. Uh, and these oscillations could then uh, be uh, observed in the CMB. But what's important to note here is that uh, the same can happen in alternatives to inflation too, although this has been a lot less studied. Um, to see this, um, just consider a massive field and, and see how it, it evolves. So it's going to usually follow an equation of motion of this form. Um, and uh, very early on, you can see that uh, you can write very generally uh, the, the expression for, for its solution. And it has, a, it has this form, um, it's quite complicated, but what I want to emphasize here is that it's basically an exponential, um, a complex exponential, so something that is oscillating. And it depends on a to the minus one here, uh, where by this notation, I mean the inverse of the scale factor. So because the scale factor enters the equation of motion, so will the solutions. And what matters is the, the inverse of this function. So to understand what happens, say again, the scale factor is just some power law, t to the power n, then the inverse will be something like a to the one over n. And uh, correspondingly, um, the, the, the solution for these uh, massive field fluctuations is gonna have such uh, power uh, one over n in it. And so if you have a different value of n, you're gonna have different types of oscillations in, in the perturbations. For instance, if you compute um, the, the, the fluctuations you get, the contribution from these massive field oscillations on top of the usual power spectrum. So if you compute this delta R compared to the PR without uh, the, the oscillations, you get these uh, sinusoidal uh, oscillations that, that go as K, a sine of K to the one over N. So once again, if you have a different value of n, uh, how these oscillations behave are gonna be very different. And to see this, um, we can look at, at these sketches here. Um, first on top, that would be the case of, of standard inflation. So if you have a massive field in inflation and you, you, you're excited, what you get on top of the background, uh, on top, uh, I mean, on top of the nearly scale invariant power spectrum, you get these small oscillations that first have uh, a very high frequency and then the, the frequency uh, goes down as you move to higher k um, as well as the amplitude is, is damping. Um, similarly if you had a slow phase of expansion uh, again you would find that the, the, the frequency starts high but then it decreases but the, the rate at which this is happening is, is uh, much faster than inflation and, and the damping is also much faster. So it's again, very different and very easy to distinguish. If you have instead a phase of contraction, then this behaves very differently. Um, the oscillations are first uh, having a, a small frequency and you, and you go to higher K, they then have a higher frequency. So that's both the case for matter contraction, which is fast contraction or slow contraction like hydrolysis. Uh, but again, because the rate is different, um, how these oscillations are evolving as a function of k are also very different. So all in all, we see that uh, depending on how uh, the evolution is, how the, the universe is evolving initially, um, it's, it's gonna change drastically how uh, these massive field uh, oscillations are gonna behave um, in, in, in the CMB. So, let me just summarize uh, what I discussed here. Um, I ended by uh, talking about uh, these massive fields. And I think that might be one of uh, interesting future avenue in, in, in the context of alternatives, uh, well, inflation and alternatives to inflation, which is be, being able to find some quite distinctive observational features of these models. And at this point, it's still, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of work to be done in, in perhaps computing the actual signal you would get from 
from models of, of uh, alternatives to inflation that have these massive fields included in them. So in, in other words, trying to do some phenomenology for, for these theories. Um, also, other possible future avenues, I, I briefly uh, mentioned that if you have a phase of contraction, black holes can form quite generically. Um, but at this point, it would be interesting to see if, if black holes do form, if that could leave some specific signals about the universe that was contracting before it bounced. In particular, if black holes uh, uh, collide, uh, perhaps it would create some gravitational wave, uh, or the black holes could sort of pass through a bound, survive, and become primordial black holes. Um, or they could evaporate and then create gamma rays that we could then observe, or at least uh, use constraints uh, from gamma rays to, to constrain the models. And so there have been a few, only a few papers um, mentioning these ideas and, and, and uh, mentioning these possibilities. Uh, but there are interesting possibilities and, and, and there's a lot of interesting work that could be done in that direction. Um, also, I think it's important to, to mention that um, a, a lot of these models I, I, I mentioned are really, well, effective models um, where we, we uh, either assume a particular potential or, or have motivation for a specific form of potential. But it, it, we haven't yet uh, built fully UV complete models uh, of the various inverse. In fact, it's one of the very challenges of inflation, but it may well be a challenge for the alternatives too. So it'd be interesting to try to build these models in, in the context of a string theory or, or some other quantum gravity model and, and hope or show or, or conversely show that it's not possible when, um, to have models that are uh, in the swamp land or not. So this is an interesting avenue for the future. And, and lastly also, well, one could try to try and develop completely new scenarios or, or new, at least new approaches. Um, once again, I mentioned if black holes form generally, if you have a contracting universe before uh, a bounce, then perhaps the black holes themselves uh, could play a certain role at high energies. And, um, I'm saying this because there's been some in interesting work um, and interesting observations, um, theoretical observations at this point, I mean, that uh, at around in, st in string theory, at around the string scale, uh, black holes and, and fundamental strings are behaving very similarly. And um, it's, very, it, it's quite likely that um, at very high density, one could have a state uh, of matter that would be composed of such stringy black holes. So this is very speculative, but if, if we push the idea a little bit, it'd be interesting to see uh, what could this apply for the very early universe, um, see what could get out in terms of cosmology uh, from this. Um, alternatively, um, that, so first that would be a case where black holes play a particular role, but alternatively, the, uh, there could be the case where uh, the universe is where you do form black holes and the, the universe actually collapses, um, those would fail. And in fact, uh, there, the bounce would rather act as a filter and only universes that haven't collapsed, maybe ones that are ecbrotic dominated, could survive and, and explain our universe. That's also a possibility and it'd be interesting to push the idea a little more. And uh, there's many other ideas, including quantum cosmology that I haven't talked about at all. And uh, all this to say that there's, uh, place for many new ideas um, in this field uh, that'd be interesting to, to pursue in the future. So that's it for part one. Um, I'm going to move to part two now, but before uh, I may pause, see if there are any questions about it. Apparently not. Okay, good. So um, I'm going to move now to the second part, which is about the bounce. So if there is a contracting uh, universe before uh, our expanding universe, then presumably they, there would have to be a transition from contraction to expansion. And then it bears a question, um, can this transition happen um, 
in a non-singular way, meaning can we avoid the singularity? This at first is obviously not, not trivial because if you have general relativity and some effective matter that, that would satisfy the null energy condition, then we know that it's inevitable. You're gonna have a singularity. So in order to avoid it, you, you need to violate the null energy condition to some extent. And to do so, well, perhaps you could um, do it with some quantum fields or by modifying your gravity theory or having hopefully a full theory of quantum gravity. Um, and at this point, well, why speculating about this? Well, maybe it's not too crazy. Um, there are some well-built, well-known examples of, of traversable wormholes that that naturally incorporate this idea that the knowledge condition can be violated. Um, similarly, in, in quantum field theory, we do expect the uh, knowledge condition to, to be violated to some extent. And usually, um, uh, one instead postulates that it's some sort of average uh, null energy condition that, that can be satisfied. And um, one possibility to have um, um, such a bound where you have an average um, T mu nu contracted with null vectors uh, smeared over some time scale tau. And this will, uh, the conjecture is that this will satisfy a bound. Uh, this will be bounded from below by a negative number. Um, so something or minus order one divided by G Newton times uh, this smearing time scale squared. And an implication of this is that um, you, in a, if you think of it in, in, in a context of cosmology, for instance, it's as if you had a, a bound on, on the curvature. So this would mean that, yeah, the, the null inch condition can be violated uh, on, on fairly uh, short time scales, allowing uh, a bound on, on a Hubble parameter in absolute value for instance. And other motivation um, could come from, from uh, string theory or quantum gravity. Um, the string theory, for instance, we could expect alpha prime corrections, which would then uh, mean that there are higher curvature terms in the action. Um, and yeah, this would motivate maybe modified gravity and then uh, singularity resolution. Similarly, in quantum gravity, um, uh, generally, string theory could be, you could have something like a straight line that would act as a fundamental minimal length scale. Um, but it, you could have also other theories, whether it's loop quantum gravity, where also you have some sort of fundamental length scale. Um, uh, and again, a, a minimal length scale. Um, and, uh, but that's not the only possibility. I think a lot of quantum gravity uh, ideas propose this idea that um, one cannot go arbitrary to arbitrarily small scales um, and that there has to be a bound on uh, uh, the, the scales of microphysics. Okay, so there are many possibilities, but um, I want to take um, the approach today of discussing particular effective theories to a building non simple cosmology. Uh, this won't be in any way comprehensive, but I'll just uh, convey some of the main ideas. So uh, a possibility is to introduce a new degree of freedom uh, to modify gravity. Um, and very generically, what we could do is to work with something like Horndesky theory, which is uh, pretty much um, one of the most uh, general action you can work with that leads to second order equation of motion. So what this means is that uh, you have a, a very general uh, action that has some free functions here, G2, G3, G4, and G5, that depend on the scale of field phi, this new degree of freedom, and its kinetic term, x, which is just partial mu, partial mu, phi, um, partial mu phi, partial mu phi, yeah. And then higher uh, derivative terms, such as box phi, the Bell inversion, um, similarly, this uh, box phi squared up to box phi cube. So, oops, pardon me. Um, and all these uh, higher derivative terms still only lead to a second order equation of motion in that case. So, at that level, you can you can trust the theory, and 
you have a new degree of freedom, but it's, it's well behaved in that sense. So you have all these free functions uh, and you can, you can do some model building and uh, it allows you to, to build in particular cosmological models where you can violate the null inch condition for some period of time. And this has been done in a number of work. And um, so in that sense, it, it's successful in, in producing non secular cosmology. But then the, the, the question that it, it bears immediately is, well, is the resulting theory stable? And that's um, one of the main criterion to, to test the, the viability of, a, of such effective uh, theories. And to, to assess this, what we do is that we look at the second order perturbation uh, for tensor, vectors, and scalar uh, perturbations. But here, let me emphasize tensor and scalar modes. And one typically has expressions uh, that look like this. So if we work with Horndesky theory, we have uh, this canonical structure, uh, kinetic term squared and a gradient term squared with some general functions uh, here, GT and FT in the tensor sector and here GS and FS in the scalar sector. And if we wanna ask for stability, the conditions become that these uh, prefactors are all uh, all these coefficients, right, they're all positive. So for instance, if we pick the scalar sector, then this means that we would need GS to be greater than zero and FS to be greater than zero. Uh, the first one would uh, ensure that we avoid any ghost instability, and the second one would ensure that we avoid any gradient instability. And I want to emphasize that these functions, GS, FS, but same for GT and FT, there are simply some functions that depend on these these GIs, these G2, G3, up to G5, and in particular, and also the uh, derivatives thereof, uh, so derivative with respect to phi and x. So I'm not writing down the expressions, but we have them and we can, for a specific uh, solution, we can then uh, address the question, is this stable or not across time? But quite generically, it was found that if you work with horn disk theory, it's, not possible to have a space time that is sing uh, non singular, meaning that it's geodesically complete and free of instabilities, uh, so free of both ghosts and greater instabilities at all times. So, what this means is that these functions GS, FS, GT, FT, a function of time, they cannot be all greater than zero for all time. It is simply not possible. Um, you can also show this at the level of an effective field theory. And uh, then, uh, a cor yeah, the, the immediate uh, corollary is that if you want to evade an OGO, well, you better maybe not work with simple Horneski. And one possibility is to go even um, to higher, uh, include higher operators, include higher order terms in the action. So in the language of EFT, it would mean that you need to include higher order operators or to work with the theory that goes beyond Horneski. Um, and there exist such uh, theories uh, that go beyond Horndesky. That still leads to second order equations in motion, but require more constraints for them to work. So this is possible, but it just means you're, you're adding more um, free functions, um, model of some constraints for, for them to work. A different approach um, could be instead of using, with, starting with a very, uh, generic theory and, and seeing, well, how can it lead to uh, singularity resolution and, and then ask the question of stability. We could start by asking, okay, let, let's build a theory that will make sure that we avoid singularity. So one possibility is to impose some constraint equation that will make sure that we're bounding curvature. So that's the idea behind limiting curvature, which is a fairly old idea dating back to in fact, the 1980s. Um, and a way of implementing this, for, in, for instance, um, as developed by uh, Mukhanov and Brandenberger in the early 90s, is to start with an action that is uh, standard GR and add to this uh, uh, a number of uh, Lagrange multipliers here called phi and multiplying some um, um, curvature invariant functions, I, that depend on the Riemann tensor, the metric, and and covariant derivative thereof, and a potential for these Lagrange like, multipliers. And what you see is that 
um, when you vary the action with respect to Lagrange multipliers, you get a set of constraint equations that tell you that if you're bounding your derivatives or the potential, uh, then you're bounding these functions i, so you're bounding your curvature. And concretely, uh, as an example, you could have these functions i1 and i2 uh, built with the, the Ricci tensors um, contracted and the Ricci scalar, such that on an FRW background, then this would be proportional to Hubble dot and this proportional to Hubble squared. And indeed, this, this, by bounding these quantities, you can make sure that you have non-singular cosmology. But uh, when we revisited that, we found that because you include these higher order terms, in fact, you, you usually run into severe instabilities. So might, that might not be the best approach at this point. Uh, but that's not the only way of implementing limiting. You know, I have one confusion just in. Yes. So in the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, so here the number of fields phi one to phi n, yeah. that n is not that n, the like, the quadratic term n equal to two you have written. Yeah, I'm just saying that that's the number of terms you include. So you could work with one um, uh, curvature invariant function. You could work with two. Here, that's an example with two curvature invariant functions. Okay. You've got i1, i2, and you would have two Lagrange multipliers, and your potential would depend on phi one and phi two. Okay. okay. But the idea is that you include a finite number of such terms. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you would maybe want to include an infinite number of them, but then the, con the theory would become obviously uh, very, complicated. very complicated to work with. Okay, so another uh, way of implementing li limiting curvature um, can actually be done in mimetic gravity. So the idea is, again, start with standard GR and add a scalar field phi that uh, will satisfy a particular constraint thanks to another Lagrange multiplier here, lambda. So the constraint is that uh, basically this, um, the, the gradient of the scalar field is uh, normalized and uh, time-like. And you also add a function of, of the deliberation of phi um, that will also be constrained with another Lagrange multiplier here, chi. And, uh, we see that it has the, this particular form of limiting curvature, meaning that uh, if you bound the partial derivative of uh, V uh, with respect to chi, then you're bounding the delimitation of phi. And as, and as an example, if phi is just uh, your time, then yeah, okay, it's gonna satisfy this first constraint. And then box phi simply becomes three times the Hubble parameter. And by bounding the derivative of the potential, you're bounding your Hubble parameter. And indeed, uh, as studied by Chempadin and Mukhanov, you can build uh, uh, some background non singular cosmology that way. Uh, but again, if you look at, at, at perturbations, you usually run into some problems. You find uh, typically uh, at least gradient instabilities in these models. Once again, that is not fully uh, conclusive. So perhaps uh, a, a better approach is to work with a theory where your scale field is completely non-dynamical. So that's the idea behind Cruscoton gravity, where um, you, you, again, you start with GR, but now you wanna have a field that is completely non-dynamical, uh, at least on a cosmological background. So this will usually be a subclass of theories that are uh, said to be minimally, uh, minimal modifications of gravity, if you will, where you only have Although you, you introduce a scalar field, you, you're left with only the standard degrees of freedom of GR in the end, so the two tensimals of GR. And the way this was originally proposed um, by F. Shorty is to start with uh, K-essence, which is a subclass of Horndesky, if you will, where you have standard GR and the scalar field, which is this P of X function, so this generic function of, of the kinetic term and the scalar field. Now, if you look at the equation of motion for the scalar field on a cosmological background, you have this expression. And if you want this field to be non-dynamical on this background, you want this coefficient, p comma x plus two, oh, I'm missing an x here, sorry, two x, p comma xx to vanish. And so if you, if you set this constraint, um, then p of x and phi can only have a particular form, which is this one. 
And furthermore, you can rescale phi to simplify this. And uh, the typical Cuthcoton Lagrangian is simply uh, some mass scale, call this ML, times the square root of x uh, minus some potential. And then it becomes clear that your equation of motion is really a constraint equation. And what you get is that simply the Hubble parameter is constrained by the derivative of the potential. And again, we see that this has a form of a limiting curvature theory. And more precisely, what you're limiting is the extrinsic curvature, and, and specifically the trace of the extrinsic curvature. Uh, and one can see this um, by computing uh, the extrinsic curvature, which, which will simply be, um, the trace will simply be a covariant derivative of a, a vector, which is the unit normal vector of a constant uh, phi hypersurface. And not too surprising, because you have this constraint on the curvature, it is very much possible to construct non-singular cosmology. Now, the per particularity here is that... Um, Aaron, yes. just one question. Uh, like, uh, we know there is in string theory something called DBI kind of theory. Yeah. Where the kinetic term is coupled with the potential also. So there, uh, this kind of ideas can be applicable? Um, because yes. here you have actually constructed the Lagrangian by putting the constraint. Yeah. But, uh, I'm saying that in DBI, this constraint satisfies? Um, I think only in a particular limit. Uh, I think you can obtain Cuscaton by taking uh, a, a particular limit of DBI. Um, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, DBI has a kinetic term that is usually something like square root of 1 minus x. Yeah. Um, so Cuscoton will be the limit where, where X is dominant, essentially. So okay. this is a, a particular limit in which the, the Cuscoton constraint would be satisfied and you would recover the, the, the same theory. But full DBI would not be the case. In, in full DBI, in fact, the scale field is still dynamical um, yeah. at the background and at the perturbative level. So here it's, it's a particular limit where you, you lose this degree of freedom, as we'll see. Okay. So yeah, what, what happens in Cuscaton is that the, the fluctuations don't propagate on this background. And you can see this by looking at the second order perturbative action for the scalar modes, um, which has, again, the standard, uh, this canonical structure with these functions gs and fs. But gs is precisely the, the quantity, is proportional to the quantity that was set to zero um, uh, in order to construct the theory. So in fact, it does not have a kinetic term. And so the, the, the perturbations there are not propagating. Um, okay, so then this can be made into a, a, a viable uh, theory by adding any matter field you, you might expect in the theory. And, and then these matter fields would then source the scalar perturbations. And you can check that the resulting curvature perturbations will be stable at all times. Um, so you're, you're avoiding the stability that would come from the field that, that gives you the non singular solution that way. And that's even true also for some generalizations of, of the Cuscaton. Um, this was what I showed here is starting with a, a P of X theory, but you could start with full horn SP and ask the same requirements that the scale of field is not propagating at a background level and does not have propagating linear fluctuations. Uh, that would give you some particular constraints on the functions of the theory. And when those are satisfied, you can construct non cellular background solutions and check the perturbations by adding matter. And you confirm that those are stable at all times. Um, in particular, uh, this idea, which is working uh, a lot better, suggests a, perhaps a new approach. And that's something we're currently looking at. And it's to revisit this idea of limiting curvature, but instead of limiting um, like the Riemann tensor and, and contractions of that, is to look at theories that are only limiting uh, curvature on a hypersurface. So where the curvature invariant functions would be um, functions of the extrinsic curvature, the, the metric on, on a hypersurface and derivatives on that hypersurface. And so example of this would be where uh, as so before, the metric means the induced metric. Yes, the induced metric on, on the hypersurface. Yeah, thank uh -huh. you. Um, 
And so there you would have, for instance, the, the, the trace of the extrinsic curvature being this contraction of the covariant derivative of a normal vector. And you can construct this normal vector um, with a gradient of a scalar field, and that would give you mimetic theory. Or it could simply be a vector field, and that would give you Cuscaton theory. Um, and, and, and where in all cases, you, you uh, make sure that this normal vector is, well, it's, it is normal vector uh, with respect to the hypersurface, and in that it is um, normalized um, and timeline. So in FRW, what this means is that your uh, extrinsic trace of the extrinsic curvature is proportional to the Hubble parameter, and you'll be bounding that quantity. And so uh, that way, we see that mimetic gravity, uh, the way I wrote it earlier, and I'm just rewriting it here, is really in this form. Um, chi is acting as the Lagrange multiplier, and box phi is related uh, to the trace of the extrinsic curvature. So that's the curvature invariant function that is bounded. Similarly, for the Cuscaton, um, it turns out that you can write it in this form, uh, which is a little less trivial, but nevertheless makes it clear that it is a, a limiting curvature theory where um, the, the, the quantity that you're bounding is the trace of the extrinsic curvature, which is related to this vector field u mu. Uh, but what makes, um, what this clarifies is also that um, the Cuscaton has one fewer degree of freedom than mimetic theory in that case, because uh, the mimetic theory was defined with this gradient of the scalar field. So when you're looking at solutions to this, you always have a new mode entering from, from uh, taking the integral of this, and you always have this additional integration constant. And in the original mimetic theory, uh, what this new mode gave you was cold dark matter, because it behaved like, like, like a, a dust field. Um, but that's also the, the mode that typically gives you the instabilities. Uh, whereas in Cuscaton, you simply do not have this, this additional degree of freedom. And lastly, let me mention that what this enables is also to bound uh, other curvature invariants built, at, built out of uh, the extrinsic curvature. In particular, you could uh, construct this, this contraction of k mu nu, and that would be um, in a Bianchi universe proportional to the anisotropy. So in addition to bounding um, uh, FRW quantities such as the Hubble parameter, you could also bound as entropy. And that's uh, work that we're currently doing. So um, now what, what's the future of all of this? Um, all, all that I mentioned was looking at the stability of, of the second order perturbation. But of course, um, one should probably go beyond that. And in particular, um, in, in standard Horndesky theory, we know that if you look at the third order third order perturbation, uh, you usually run into strong coupling problems because your sound speed is getting very close to zero. Or in fact, even in some cases like P of X, pure P of X, you, you can run into non-unitarity. Um, with that respect, uh, usually beyond Horndesky theories are, are doing better. Um, but then it bears the question, of how about the Cuscaton? Well, uh, maybe it should be doing a lot better too because uh, the Cuscaton is actually not propagating any degree of freedom. And for the, the models that were studied in, in more details, it was confirmed that the sound speed doesn't get anywhere uh, near zero. So it, it might be doing better. Um, and one could go even beyond that and maybe ask question about stability non perturbatively but that would involve uh, perhaps numerical analysis. And there's only a few ideas uh, in that direction right now. Similarly, other uh, uh, interesting questions could involve um, going beyond just standard effective theories and look at maybe UV completions of those um, and perhaps try to find non singular solutions in full quantum gravity theories, possibly a string theory. Um, and one avenue that is currently being studied is to look at solutions that would be non perturbative uh, in an alpha prime expansion of string theory. Uh, and, uh, It'd be interesting to see what, what can be obtained at IK. So let me summarize. Um, um, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I, I really tried to give you an overview of bouncing cosmology. And, and I talked at first about two models of contracting universe, matter bounce cosmology 
which as we saw is quite a nice idea, but at the level of what it predicts, it might not be on the best footing at this point. Um, then there was exprotic cosmology that um, can work quite nicely. Um, but for all of them, I think it will be interesting to, is to put them even more to the test in the future. And from the theoretical perspective, maybe uh, looking at the sort of phenomenology of having massive fields uh, could be uh, interesting in that respect. Um, but I also think that it would be neat if we can continue to find new ideas um, for the very early universe. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot that can be uh, done, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and then in the second part, I talk about uh, singularity resolution. And I try to convey the ideas that it's, it's not so simple to have a non singular cosmology that doesn't have any instability. Um, you can do it possibly with having a very general theory that has a uh, number of higher order operators in it uh, with many free functions. Or alternatively, you could work with a, a much simplified theory, something that is very constrained like, like the Cuscoton, where in fact, uh, you, you don't have any new degree of freedom appearing um, when you're talking about cosmology. But still, um, a, a lot of these theories uh, come with, with many questions that, that remain to be addressed. Um, and uh, yeah, we, there's still a lot to be studied to see whether those are viable theories uh, to describe the very high energy uh, state of our early universe. So that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, I request all of you to unmute yourself and you can uh, uh, open your camera as well. Uh, you can ask any question, whatever you want to ask to Jerome, please. And before that, we have to clap for giving a very clear talk. And uh, I hope you guys have really enjoyed and uh, get benefited with this clear talk. So we should clap for Jerome. Um, a lot of people are there. Please ask question. Hello. Yeah, ask. Who wants to ask? Just tell your name and then ask the question. Elisa, you want to ask any question? Nitin? Not right now, sir. There is a lot to digest. Shatoki? <laughs> uh, I could ask a question, Sayantan. Yeah, yeah, please, please ask. Um, yeah, as, as they said, there's a lot of digest uh, here, so I can't no, follow everything. Please, please introduce yourself first and then ask the question. Yeah, yeah I'm uh, Ali uh, from University of Cologne. Um, my question is, are these singularities that, uh, that we encountered, are they, can we consider them a BKL singularity? Like, it, are, are some of the models chaotic or it is not clear or? Right. So, yeah, I, I didn't address that really. Um, if you don't have any new physics, um, if you just have GR and, and normal matter, indeed, uh, when a contraction is is happening, uh, I, I mentioned that enzotropy is usually grow uh, very fast. And Correct. The the the, the more correct way uh, of analyzing this, as you mentioned, is to look this at an, in a truly enzotropic space time. And what you see is that uh, you have a, a a very chaotic behavior in in the way that the enzotropies are evolving, and and that's the usual BKL. Instability. Um, now, all of this is trying to avoid that. So, 
in particular ekpradic cosmology, the idea is that you're you're really washing out is usually the term used uh, the anisotropy. So you're you're diluting them and uh, and you're avoiding this this BKL instability. You're avoiding this chaotic mm, okay. mixed master behavior. Now uh, this goes up to some fixed high energy scale, but at, at, at some point you would hope that you have again new physics entering something that would uh, provide you with a, a non singular bounds. Of course, if you have a singular bounds, then that's that's a different I issue. Uh, but if you want something non singular, then you have to to check that well you're you're avoiding the singularity at the level of of the FRW background and that's something I mentioned like bounding the Hubble parameter but you also want to check in that case that uh, once again your anisotropies are not blowing up and that you can bound uh, if you have some, a Bianchi universe or of, of any form uh, that you're bounding the anisotropies and uh, that might be um, achievable it's a, a lot let me mention that it's a lot less studied uh, how anisotropies evolve um, to a non-singular bounds and if they're bounded or not, because usually we it's simpler to assume just FRW. But um, and and the one of the future work that I mentioned, uh, we're currently looking at uh, a bouncing cosmology with anisotropies and looking at how these can be bounded. And so in that case, it would definitely avoid the um, chaotic mix ma mixed master uh, instability. See, thank you, thank you, Joe. Um, any other people wants to ask a question? Uh, hi, Jerome. Uh, this is Abhinash. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, so uh, my question uh, is about uh, horn disk theory. So in that uh, uh, Lagrangian you wrote, you basically started from G two. Is that because you have a second order equation? That's why you started with G two, or there is any particular reason? Mm, I think this is just. As far as I know, nomenclature. Um, okay. Um, I th I know. I think I think I know. I think it. I think it goes back to um, the um, Galilean theory. I mean, I, I didn't talk about that at all. But I think okay. the reason is that you can rewrite um, this as uh, a, a quartic Galilean, uh, and if you include G three, you get a cubic Galilean. Okay. Um, yeah, but I didn't talk about that at all. Uh, okay, and uh, I have another question. So uh, we're looking for basically a, a singularity-free cosmology, general singularity-free space-time. Okay, so uh, so uh, Hawking basically said there is singularity. Now we are looking for non non-singular space times. So like uh, since we don't have any particular proof for singularities, we are looking for this type of space time, or uh, like why are we even looking for such space times? It's just our we are postulating this thing. Yes, that's that's the idea. Is that um, it, we're starting by making the the assumption that we want to avoid the the, the, okay. the singularity. Uh, you could say that you're you're perfectly fine with with the singularity, and it's it's a valid viewpoint. Um, but now we're we're taking the point of view that okay, we 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 don't want a singularity. How can this be done? And I think I, I'm simply arguing that is not too crazy in the sense that if you have a, a quantum theory of gravity then you most probably expect to, to be avoiding singularities uh, that might come from, from different things we don't know uh, so we're just trying different approaches and seeing where they lead right Right. Uh, so uh, I have one last question. So uh, uh, there was something called uh, uh, asymptotic asymptotic safety. Okay, in that also, like uh, they they talk about black holes this time without singularities. Yeah. So uh, uh, so uh, so is that different approach or how? Like, can you relate these two methods the way you are working with with them? Or? Uh, it's very related. I think. Um, in fact. Uh, I know of uh, a few examples of uh, uh, asymptotically safe theories um, that, that give you non-singular cosmology, non-singular black holes even, as you mentioned, that are built okay. from, um, from mimetic gravity. Uh, in fact, Mukhanov has worked a lot on this lately. 
Okay. And um, there are very similar ideas, except uh, the main change is that you're, you're also changing the Einstein-Hilbert uh, term. And instead of having the standard n Planck over two times the Ricci scalar there, you have, you have something that is non-minimally coupled to, to gravity. Uh, so the, your gravitational constant essentially is a function of, of the mimetic field in that case. And it, ha it has okay. a particular functional form such that at high energies, the, the theory becomes asymptotically free. And, uh, and in particular, it, it, avoids, uh, it, it avoids sync parity. So okay. that, that's one, one uh, implementation of that idea that I, that I know of, which is very related to what I talked about. Okay, okay, fine. Thank you. It was a nice talk. Thank you. Uh, any other question anybody wants to ask? Toji and some other people? Elisa? Still hard to digest. <laughs> I think uh, I no. covered a lot. Um, that was, uh, yeah, I went over a lot of topics. Uh, no, but not I, too much detail, but also the part is it is recorded, so you can actually go through and uh, yeah, then it yeah. Nice. So I just end with one simple thing. At present, from the observational side, can you distinguish between inflation and bounce? Well, you have to to specify which model of bouncing cosmology you're talking about. But uh, in any case, definitely yes. Um, I think let me go back and and pick. Say you pick a product cosmology. Um, at the level of of um, just a two point function, this two point scalar function, I don't think so because well, usually predict n s to be uh, n s yeah. to be point nine point nine six. I mean, blah blah blah. Um, that's fine. But then when you go and look at um, maybe non gaussianities um, you typically, it's hard to say at this point because uh, here you would predict order one to 10 on Gesch entities. Um, okay, that's quite generic. But then inflation, the problem there is that inflation, you could have basically vanishing um, yeah, that, uh, like, inflation, but you could also have large. It is a problem in inflation. Yeah, because yeah, you could have something like DBI inflation where you have a small yeah. sound speed too, and then you, you create non gaussian entities. Yeah. So, okay, I admit there would be hard to distinguish because, yeah, there's a wealth of, of inflationary models. But where it might be interesting is at the level of the it's consensus zero ratio. Um, if it were measured to some finite value, if you, if you don't have a bound, but rather you have an actual number, if you do measure prominent gravitational waves, then it would effectively rule out necrotic cosmology. Okay. Um, if, however, you, you get a bound and the bound gets lowered and it becomes smaller than 10 to the minus three, let's say, with the very, very, very good experiments, um, then it's less clear because there's still inflationary models that could give you a very small tensor scale ratio and ecrotic cosmology. So at that point, um, it would be hard to distinguish them. But that's where maybe things like uh, oscillations, features become in, in, interesting because um, those would produce very different signals, uh, although they'll be harder to detect because we're talking about tiny oscillations on top of uh, the power spectrum or top of, of the, the three-point function. But um, yeah, in the future, uh, we certainly expect experiments to improve. Um, and so if, if the bound on tensor, scalar ratio, tensor to scalar ratio is really improved, so will uh, the, the measures on, on the two point and three point function. So, so it's still promising in, in the sense of uh, and, uh, being uh, able to distinguish. Uh, like one more question is, uh, if we know in inflation something called light bound. Yeah, so which actually tells you about the in which scale inflation is going on and the like field uh, excursion is Planckian or super Planckian, whatever. 
Now, is that kind of thing exist here? The similar kind of thing? Well, not not really, because um, in the case of, of these contracting scenarios, um, you don't have a fixed energy scale. Rather, you're you're spanning a fairly large um, uh, range of, of of scales. So, because the Hubble parameter is an absolute value growing, uh, you start at very small scales and you're going to higher energy scales. Uh, However, it doesn't mean that it would be impossible to, to determine uh, the, the scales at enter. An example of this um, that I briefly mentioned is that in, in at least in, in matter bounds, what happens is that the, the, the amplitude of the scalar bound spectrum is determined by the scale at the end of the contracting phase, mm -hmm. or if you will, the beginning of this bouncing phase, the transition from contraction to expansion. And what this means is that if that were a viable model, um, then from an AS, which we know is about um, 10 to the minus, uh, I have a blank, 10 to minus 9, am I saying anything stupid? Um, you 10 to the power minus 9, yeah. Yeah. Um, then you immediately get what is this Hubble scale at the bounce. Uh, it tells you essentially the scale of, of the new physics there when it enters. Um, but I, I want to stress again that this is not a fixed, well, it is a fixed energy scale because it, it's a, at a certain point in time. But it, it was not the energy scale throughout the, the, this early phase. Rather, that, that was the, the maximal energy scale. Uh, it's only an in inflation that this is a constant. And Okay, so that's the first part. The, the second question is about field excursion. Um, again, it's very, whoops, again, it's very different here because uh, it, for instance, in matter bounds, um, one way of modeling it is with an oscillating scale of field. So we're, yeah, it's not so interesting to talk about field excursion. We can talk about the, the amplitude of this, but um, yeah, it's not the same thing. In the context of ekphotic, there is some field excursion. Um, the, the, the scale field is basically rolling down this negative exponential potential. Mm -hmm. And um, however, it, right now I can't think uh, what, how this would enter the observables. Yeah, it, it's. And uh, yeah, I, 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 at least I definitely do not know of uh, something similar to the light bound. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that. That's why I'm asking because nobody have actually. And uh, thirdly, I want to ask that uh, this, uh, um, like in inflation, we know that if you calculate the perturb perturbations, then you can actually write down your observables and there should be some consistency relations. Mm -hmm. Okay, in bouncing cosmology in different, different contexts, is there is that kind of uh, consistency relation exists? Right. Um, no, I, either there's no such consistency or they'll be different. So that might be another way of distinguishing them. Yeah. Um, here, okay, um, again, it varies from model to model, but in, in, uh, if you take matter bounds here, you could talk about a consistency between the tensor scalar ratio and non Gaussianities. That's something that, that came up very often. Unfortunately, it, it came up as a way of, of ruling, out, ruling out the models, or maybe fortunately, because you're really learning something. Um, in terms of consistency between, say, and S and uh, and let's see, I can't think of. Yeah, sometimes you can have uh, consistency between the running alpha S and N S. Um, I know you can get that in necrotic. Um, yeah. Um, so if you if we were to constrain S quite well, alpha S, I mean, quite well. Um, that could be a way of constraining the models. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, in inflation, you also have co uh, consistency with uh, the NT, the spectral index of 
tensor modes. Um, in, um, in matter bounds, um, well, maybe it's not so interesting, but because it, the, the tensor modes will be very large, but it, say for the models that do work where you have these, uh, where, where you're working with horn key, still you would have the NT to be the same as NS essentially, because, um, um, because yeah, they, 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 they follow the same evolution. They come from the same initial conditions. Um, again, assuming that your equation state is more or less constant. It would depend on the time dependence of these functions. So it's less clear and that's something that, um, well, at this point I don't know, or I, I don't even sure it's been really studied, but uh, um, that might be a way of getting a cons consistency between NS and NT. And finally in uh, for product, well, it doesn't really make sense to talk about NT. NT is simply two uh, and it's a constant. Um, so yeah, it does no, well, it is a consistency, but uh, it, it, all, it simply means that we're not, uh, we can't measure uh, yeah. the parameter of gravitational waves uh, on, on scales of the CMB. Last question, uh, which is like uh, in inflation people used to do, which is called reconstruction. Right, I'm reconstructing the potential. Uh, yeah, potential or power spectrum kind of thing. That kind of thing is possible here as well? Yeah. Um, so what I showed here, that was precisely the, the reconstruction of the power spectrum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and right, and out of this, you could also do one more reverse process and, and sort of undo the evolution of the, of the, of the curvature perturbation and ask what kind of potential uh, yeah. can give rise to this um, power spectrum, assuming some theory. So in, in the case of inflation, you assume a scalar field, minimally coupled, a canonical kinetic term potential, and you say, what kind of potential can give you that? You, you could do, yes, I think, um, a similar thing. Um, for the alternative. No, but I, I just asked you because the one thing in the case of inflation, people used to uh, uh, like uh, utilize all those consistency relations to mm -hmm. construct the potentials. But here you won't have that much freedom. So right. yeah, so that's why I'm asking that, uh, is it very complicated job or people have done uh, this kind of work before? Uh, to construct bouncing. Right. I definitely do not know of, of, of studies that, that have done that. Um, and well, yeah, as you, I think you, you said something important is that in a lot of these alternatives, I think there's a lot less freedom in the sense that, yeah. um, well, you, you, you have one form of potential, you have one or two parameters and that's basically it. Um, so you can reconstruct these parameters essentially get a constraint on them. Um, that's certainly doable and we know uh, pretty much what these parameters have to be. Hmm. Um, but there's no point, we're not, there's not thousands of potential forms with thousands of parameters, which yeah, yeah. it's a lot more constrained and we know what they can or cannot be in that case. Uh, and that's it. Okay, so uh, again, clap for Jeron for giving a very clear talk. Uh, uh, this talk will be posted very soon and I will uh, email Jerome as well about the talk. And next week, the speaker is uh, Stefano Profumo from University of California, uh, Santa Cruz. So he will be talking about general aspects of dark matter. Uh, his title is like, why dark matter? Okay. So see you guys in the next week. Jerome, please ap appear in the next week as well. Hope yeah. to see you again. Yeah. And all of you, uh, please go through the video. If you have anything, then you can actually write to Jerome and ask questions. Certainly. So, bye. Good. Thank you, Sayantan. Goodbye. Thank you, sir.